time we have. Um, so, so I'll let you, I'll let you drive. Um, happy to go any direction. Nothing's off limits. You can take this in an entrepreneurial sense. You can take this in a, you know, stock market direction. We can talk, you know, options and theoreticals. I don't, I don't, I don't really care. Um, I do think it's an interesting, you know, like you mentioned, the timing is perfect because there's a lot of people listening today, especially, you know, if we're talking between, let's say 19 and 24 year olds where that have never seen, you know, really anything like what we're experiencing right now, at least for the start of 2022. Um, so, you know, happy to, happy to talk about, you know, market corrections, happy to talk about certain kinds of events, high, high implied volatility. I mean, you name it here, this is, we've got it all. There, there's a very high level of fear right now, which makes, which makes the market very interesting. Well, and, and that's one thing I particularly want you to talk about, Tom, because uh, unfortunately we have grown up in a time where we take our children and we make sure that they have a helmet on when they ride a bicycle. When they're in school, we make sure that they color in between the lines. And I've noticed even from my students in this class, when I discuss different aspects of trading and investments, they are they're they're somewhat reluctant to take risks it's a risk averse generation there's a lot of reasons for that um you know i i mean i used to joke with my kids and they then they'd give me the lecture of yeah yeah dad i know you know used to walk you know no shoes you know all the way to the you know all the way to the country club with no shoes in the snow uphill the whole deal um but uh, it is a risk averse generation. Part of it is, you know, life's more expensive now. School's more expensive. Loans are heavier than, especially when, when I went to school, things like that. But part of it's also the culture. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things have changed over the last couple of decades. But the good thing is that access to markets right now, it's never been easier. It's never been more affordable. And you've never been able to do what you can do today with less capital. So there's really... There's no excuse for not engaging, you know, in the listed markets, at least from that's my viewpoint. I just don't see any way, you know, or any reason why somebody, especially that's studying finance or investing, should not be involved in the markets. So, Tom, how do you uh, for, for those that are reluctant, that are sitting on the sideline and that are going, hey, I'm scared, you know, uh, volatility's yeah. up. It's, it's yeah. an uncertain time. How do they how, how would you encourage them to be involved? Well, the one thing you have to understand about volatility is that it you can it truly is the glass, you know, half empty if you want to play the nervous side or it's the glass half full if you want to play the optimistic side. And the glass half full side is interesting because the one thing people don't understand about uh, or they tend not to understand about high implied volatility, which is just expected move, is that for the increase in downside risk there's also the exact same increase in upside potential. So what you get with um, high implied volatility and lower prices like we have today is actually a lot more upside than you get in a market, in a market that's, you know, uh, for example, a bull market, you have the potential for more upside. So if it's, you know, if there's stocks that you've been following or there's company, I shouldn't say stocks, but if there's companies you've been following for the last couple of years and something seems interesting to you, um, and it could be long or short. I don't care. I'm, you know, I'm very comfortable either side of the market. But there's a lot of companies that are trading at, you know, uh, 60, 70, and 80% off their highs from just the last, you know, 18 months. And I think there's a lot of interesting plays out there. It's a great time to get involved. Here, here's the thing, Bobby, that what most people don't understand, especially, especially university students, is that one of the greatest skills you can leave school with is your ability to articulate financial opportunity. And most, most kids miss this. Um, your ability to talk about markets, to talk about risk-taking, to talk about, I'm not even saying to do it, but you can't learn how to talk about it unless you learn how to do it. But the, the opportunity now to learn about how markets work, how to take risk, how to use strategy in the markets, and then your ability to articulate what you've done is invaluable during the interview process. 
and during the whatever you know whatever you're going to use as your process to get to whatever your career might look like. So I think that that's something that you cannot discount is the speed at which you make decisions, your ability to make decisions and take risk, and your ability to articulate what you're doing. And that's all critical. And Tom, that's something that you said, uh, you know, back when I started following you back in 2012, is that uh, trading will make you a better decision maker. It'll mm -hmm. make you a quicker decision maker. And these are skills that uh, these students in college definitely need to come out of a program like this with. Yeah, I mean, you know, I look back at m my entire career, and I've been doing this for four decades now. And I look back at my entire trading career, and I think about, like, could we have ever built the businesses we built if we didn't, if we hadn't been trading and made all these crazy trading decisions over the years and really learned how to take risk? You know, would we have rolled the dice not once, not twice, you know, maybe 10 or 20 times. And I think that, you know, and, and basically put it all out there. And I think it would have been really hard to do if we, you know, weren't comfortable taking risk. And I don't think taking risk is something that comes naturally for most people, especially business risk. I think it's a learned skill and the speed at which you take risk. And I think this is really hard for, for young people to understand early on the speed at which you make those decisions ultimately determines your career path because people want to work with, they want to hire and they want to work with people that are quick decision makers and that are confident in their decision. We know everybody's not going to be right. We just want you to be confident and make the damn decision. Well, it's kind of like uh, when I sold my very first put or it was actually a put spread uh, on the S&P 500 on SPY, you know, uh, I knew the probabilities, I, I knew everything, but I was glued to the screen to see what my $3 wide put spread would do over the course of the next 20 to, you know, to 30 days. And now I can put those trades on and not be glued to the market or to the screen. I can have a life and uh, make those decisions based on the probabilities and known Sure. Factors of when I put the trade on and then forget about it. Now, Tom, during the time uh, of me starting in 2012 to today, maybe I have blown out of an account or two. But as I look over that, I don't see it as something that was detrimental to my learning. Learning is actually something that helped me. I think that's really important. And now let's let's talk about your um, your class for a second, because. What's important to you is one thing, but what's important to, you know, a 22 year old or 23 year old, it's life changing. And, you know, I can't, I can't stress this enough, but when we talk to people, like we're looking for strong, quick decision makers who can articulate finance and financial strategies. It's, it's one thing to understand, you know, academically um, how things work. It's another thing to have participated where there's an emotional and a monetary outcome that, that impacts you and to understand you know, what the factors that go into that, um, to that impactful result are. And once you understand that, you are far more valuable. It doesn't matter what the role is. You know, like you said, there's a lot of people there um, that are going through the process of the um, certified financial planning you know, um, test, which is, I've never taken that particular test. I heard it's quite difficult. Um, and, but, but listen, I'm sure, you know, uh, everybody will do great. It's just, um, I think that there's a lot of aspects of that, of what goes into that thing where, where you just have to understand, you know, what markets, like, how is it, it's very difficult to understand how market structure works without actually having participated inside the system, inside of that ecosystem and inside of that environment. Once you've participated in stock options, futures, futures options, stock options, indexes, crypto and everything else, you start to understand market structure at a completely different level. And it gives you a much better chance. And again, I, you know, articulation is one thing, but just understanding and having been there and taking that risk is an incredibly powerful tool for setting up the rest of your, you know, um, uh, let's let's call it ability to network inside of an industry. 
And Tom, you, you mentioned the, that some of these uh, students will be taking the CFP exam, that they will be financial planners. And there are great financial planners out there. There are people that you know, need help with uh, insurance, with risk management, with, so many, with retirement, with, with uh, so many different things. But when it comes to investments and investment advisors, one thing that stood out to me when uh, I first you know, heard of you is one thing that you said, I don't know if you remember this time, but you said, listen, if you're going to interview a financial advisor that's going, or an investment advisor that's going to help you, you need to ask them one very important question. Do you remember what that question is, Tom? I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that I'll I said you on the spot. at the time, I, I'm going to guess that I said at the time, um, how do you improve my basis and improve my probability of profit? Exactly. And I thought, what the hell is he saying? You know, I said, what, what are you talking about, Tom? I mean, you buy a stock, you hold that stock until you die. You know, you, you pass it on. I got it. I what, know. Are, what are you talking about uh, reducing cost basis? And that's exactly what I've been telling my students. So explain on that farther and what we can do with options and, and with all the tools that are available to us to reduce cost basis and improve our probabilities of success. Well, in 2022, um, the world's a very different place with access to strategy, technology, strategy, and, and various markets than it was, you know, three, four, five, ten years ago. And the, the concept of, of, like, if you're going to be a, a really skilled financial planner, you need to be able to differentiate yourself. And nobody can truly differentiate themselves. I mean, once you understand how this industry works, you will know that there's no such thing as true differentiation by saying, I'm a better stock picker than the next guy, because you're not. Or saying that I know what's going to happen next, because you're not. Or saying our firm has better research than some other firm, because they don't. And I mean, the markets are too random for that. And none of that stuff is true. But what is reasonable is to say, hey, I like XYZ stock, or it could be XYZ anything, it could be commodity, could be stock, doesn't matter what it is. I like XYZ underlying, but you don't have to explain why you like it. Maybe you like it because the price is cheap. Maybe you like it because you just like the company, you know, you don't mind giving them your credit card. Maybe you like it because you like what they have to offer. Who knows, who cares, nobody, it doesn't matter to me. The difference between you as an investor, as a financial planner, as an advisor, whatever it is, is that you need to understand how to make that purchase of that stock a more interesting talking point for the person that you're doing it for, for the person you're investing for than anybody else. So if you say to me, Bobby, if you're a financial planner and I'm a financial planner or a financial advisor, you're a financial advisor and you say, I like XYZ because, because our research analysts said they're the best company in the field. I would say, okay, that's great, but you're full of crap because everybody's going to say that. And then, or you go to, if you said to me, why should I do this? My response would be, well, they have a liquid derivatives marketplace. And what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to buy the stock and we're going to sell. Uh, let me turn this off. I got noise going on trading in the background here. Sorry about that. Tom, that's fine. I'm doing the same. I'm going to say, hey, we're going to buy the stock. We're going to sell a call against it. And instead of a 50-50 chance, um, I'm going to lower your cost basis on this stock by $5. So let's say it's a $100 stock. I'm going to improve your cost basis by 5%. And I'm going to improve your probability of profit on this trade by 12%. All we're doing is limiting some upside, which is totally fine because limiting upside is a high class problem. And all of a sudden then it's a much more interesting discussion because person A says, hey, you got a pure 50-50 shot, except our analysts are really good. And person B says, I don't give a crap about your analysts, but I'm giving you a legit mathematical 5% discount on the stock and a 62% probability of profit. And all we're doing is limiting some upside. And you'd be like, okay, I'll take, I'll take door number two. Because it makes sense. Because there's, a, there's, a, there's a mathematical logic chain that supports it. And I think all of finance needs to be supported by a mathematical logic chain. That's all. And by purchasing a stock, Tom, what's our uh, probability of profit just by buying the shares? Say that, say that one more time. For example, what most people would do is just buy shares of, of, a, of a company, sure. hold those shares, 
and not realize that that's a 50-50 proposition, that the stock could go up, the stock could go down. So what we're doing is doing some derivative trading around the stock that in, improves our probability of success. And, and bring that up again, Tom, by limiting our profitability, what does that do? Well, anytime you limit your profitability, you, you have to get paid something in return. So just think about, think about how markets... Markets are very efficient. They're not like anything else. The rest of the world operates in, in a inefficient, let's call it an inefficient pricing fashion. Almost virtually every industry is priced inefficiently because there's not that much competition slash arbitrage opportunities available to price one thing against something else. You know, person manufacturing company A owns this product. It's, it's their price or no price. You know, other company B owns some other product. It's their price or no price. In the financial world, everything is fungible. Everything is duly listed. Um, prices are fair and they're efficient. So in, in, in our world, you know, there's, there's usually a thumb strategy or some form of being able to reduce the, um, the price at which you're willing to pay for something, which by definition... Either you reduce price gives you a higher probability of profit, or if you limit your profitability, you have to have something, you have to be rewarded somewhere else. So if you limit your prop, potential profitability, you have to have a higher probability of profit. But you can't, if you want unlimited profitability, you're gonna have a lower probability of profit. If you have limited profitability, you're gonna have a higher profit, probability of profit. And that's something that most people don't understand. And I think if they understood that, most people would opt for a higher probability of profit and potentially less money. I'd rather have a, I'd rather yeah, have a 70% probability of making $30 than a 30% probability of making $70. It's exactly right. And, and most people would opt for that. And especially, you know, in a risk averse generation, things like that. You know, one of the interesting things about certain marketplaces like crypto, for example, which I'm sure a lot of your students, you know, participate in, is there's no derivatives marketplace yet in the U.S. That's 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 you know at this point legal in the U.S. So so there's not really a way to reduce basis. So most people just buy and hold. That's all there is. You can buy and hold crypto. That's about it. But the rest of the financial universe, it's it's very it's it's very deep now, and there's an incredible amount of efficiency. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, options options and, and we can talk about futures or anything else, they're just some theoretical share equivalent. That's all it is. Like, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. Like when you were talking before about, you know, um, selling a put spread or something, you know, really when you sell a put spread in the spider is like you were mentioning before, really all you're doing is, is creating a very small amount of theoretical long stock. That's all it is. You know, just we take the delta of the of the short option minus the delta of the long option, and that is the net number of shares that you're long. And it works perfect. I mean, you know that that's that is the pure amount of money that you're going to make depending on what the stock is ultimately does. But but that puts your risk in context. And I I don't think Bobby that that we do a good job in academia. I mean, there's a lot of professors like you that are finally starting to you know get on the bandwagon, understand the importance of really of really getting into the um, the nitty gritty or the nuts and bolts of you know of of in depth finance, it, it's much more than a Black Scholes model. It's it's really the application of practical finance. Tom, I was so excited about having you on uh, that I had trouble sleeping uh, last night. I really did. So I got up at two o'clock in the morning. And for those of you that watch uh, the Showtime uh, show series Billions. I was watching Billions last night. And, uh, you know, it's interesting as we talk about this, limit your profitability, uh, increase your probability of success. Taylor was on there and they were buying call options on some uh, vegan, some, some company or something. It was just interesting watching that, you know. And so in that theoretical uh, world of buying calls, Taylor was wanting to experience unlimited profitability, correct? Unlimited profitability, but with a much lesser probability of success because she was actually buying calls rather than, than selling options. 
that that's a whole different like that's a different game which you know again um most of the out of the money call options come with unlimited profitability and a very low probability of success and um but as long as you know what you're you know know what you're buying when you buy it or know what you're selling when you sell it it makes a big difference um you know we spend we spend literally tens of millions of dollars creating content to just just get people engaged because it ultimately fuels you know our other businesses you know that you know to get people excited about you know engaged in trading excited about financial markets market structure and how all these products and strategies work but the cool thing today is the front end technology is so good like you can take any product or any strategy and they're they're really you know we we were indifferent to all of them it doesn't matter what you do where you do it like you know if you're you're a farmer and you want to trade you know corn wheat or soybeans there's no different from trading um IBM Microsoft or, or Intel so we're talking about trading we're talking about investing we've we've got our college students here uh, that are that are taking all kinds of classes they're they're going to be uh leading their own portfolios they're going to be leading you know helping their families potential clients uh, going on in the future and um I, I, when i first started teaching them i was like okay guys talk to me about fundamental analysis what does fundamental analysis mean for you and your portfolio tom i'd love to hear and i've already heard but i know our students have not talk to us about the fundamental analysis what does that mean for this generation of investor and trader well, I think that if you go back a few decades, and I'm talking about, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe even, um, and a little less so as you get into the 90s. But when you go back in time into kind of like Warren Buffett's heyday and George Soros heyday and, you know, Carl Icahn's heyday as, as you know, truly great fundamental investors, the dissemination of information didn't exist like it exists today. And there was a lot less that was known, um, uh, and and investors, you know, really successful hedge fund managers relied on fundamental analysis because that's essentially what they had at their fingertips. There wasn't there wasn't really you know quantitative. There wasn't ways to measure things quantitatively, statistics, probability. There wasn't a lot of efficiency in the derivatives marketplace. There was no way to you know to to back into variables, and so. Um, I think that I think a very important um, takeaway from it all was that fundamental analysis back in the day, um, you know, worked for a few really successful um, money managers and hedge fund managers. But we're talking about a long time ago. Fundamental analysis, which is which is um, uh, which is done now, I believe, to prevent to protect advisors from litigation more than anything else. I don't know that there's any information out there that everybody doesn't have access to. And I'm not sure that there's any edge at all. In fact, if anything, it's probably a little bit negative with respect to what you can do fundamentally or technically um, you know, in the world of finance. I'd like to believe that in the last 20 years, we've led kind of the revolution towards um, very aggressive, probabilistic, and statistical kinds of quantitative analysis to basically let the math play its course. Like our argument is there's, there's a reasonable math explanation for the way everything's priced, but that's the only thing that we feel really confident about. Like, so in other words, I can't tell you what's gonna happen next with some underlying, but I can tell you based on the way an efficient derivatives market is priced approximately what the expected move will be over the course of time, whether that's two days, two weeks, you know, two months or two years based on everything that we know. And so it's almost like if you have a line on a football game, for whatever reason, you know that line's pretty good. Well, imagine that instead of a line being, let's say seven points, you have a one penny wide market on, just to give your class an example, if you were to bet $100,000 on a sports bet, the VIG would be almost 10%. And that, that let's cut it in half because there's a winner or a loser. So let's say it's a 5% VIG. On a $100,000 
um, trade in the marketplace on a $100,000 notional, the VIG is about, is, is about $5. So in the one hand, you have, you know, you have a $5,000 VIG versus a, $500, versus a $5 VIG. And when you talk about that big a difference, 5,000 versus $5, you know, that's, that's how efficient financial markets are. And that means that that number is actually portraying what's every single thing that's known about that marketplace at that specific moment in time. And to me, that's really interesting, but most people don't realize it. So why go down the, the wormhole of, of, of digging through the financials and the statements and the cable and all of the information? Well, I, don't, I don't think anybody needs to anymore, Bobby. I don't, think, I don't think that's something that anybody needs to do as an individual investor. I think, I think that big firms, if you're talking about, you know, like, you know, if you're talking about the big advisory firms or places like that, or, you know, or somebody that's managing a high net worth portfolio, I think that they do it because they want their advisors to be backed up, you know, in case of um, arbitration or litigation. So if the markets are efficiently priced, which I believe yep. they are, if everything is built in, what is our edge? Well, we can argue that a lot because, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of outliers, number one. Um, and, you know, I'm going to argue that our edge is that you as an individual get to do whatever it is that you want to do. Now, I know that seems kind of corny, but I think that the one thing you have to realize is if, if it's a level playing field between the individual investor and between the counterparty who's actually, you know, one thing people have to understand is when, when you make a trade, like you buy something or sell something, you're not trading with another customer. You're, you're, you're basically interacting. The counterparty is a professional high frequency firm that's, that's facilitating your order. So they, their job is only to facilitate. They don't care what you do. Your job is to decide what it is you want to do. To me, that's, that's your edge. You get to choose what you want to do and the markets are incredibly tight around what you want to do. And then you get to mechanically manage and adjust that position as you see fit. So your edge in my mind is your ability to do what you want to do and then manage and adjust that as you see fit. And that's it, but that's all you can ask for. You're never going to have a positive edge. You know, you walk into a casino and you have a negative edge the second you sit down and it's a significant negative edge. You walk into, you know, you, you get into the marketplace and the listed financial markets, there's no, there's no negative edge. There's a cost for you to do business. There's a cost for the counterparty to do business, but the markets are a penny wrapped a penny around mid price. There's nothing else there. So there's no, no edge one way or the other. To me, that's a level playing field. So are we as retail traders and investors, are we disadvantaged? by the high frequency firms that are participating in the market or does that help us? That helps you. That helps you, that, that provides marketplace efficiency. I mean, that's your, that's your, that allows you to do whatever Bobby wants to do, that allows you to do it. Well, I take it back to, Tom, I used to, to do a lot of real estate investing uh, and the time required to go out and be with properties and to show properties and to, to renovate properties and to do all of that was just so time consuming. I can do basically everything that I did in real estate and I can do it in the financial markets. I can do it sitting in my underwear behind a screen at my house or at the beach or, you know, in the car for that matter. Yeah, you know, wherever I'm at, I can do what I used to do with real estate. I can still maintain inventory with my positions. I can still do, uh, all, I, can, I can convert them into rental properties basically by selling options around my stocks. Why would, why would someone not want to do something that is so efficient and so quick and so fast, and especially with the technology that's out there now, Tom? Um, I mean, the reason people choose not to is because, um, uh, you know, they're intimidated by the, uh, by the number of products, by the technology. You know, real estate's still pretty old-fashioned. It hasn't, it hasn't gone to the next you know, it, it hasn't met its technology master yet. You know, like it hasn't gone to the next generation. It's, it, there's been various aspects of it that have in, in, most, in most fields, we've experienced some kind of a technological evolution or 
technological transition, but real estate, no matter what, it's still a very high margin, you know, crazy high commission, very slow moving um, asset. It, the, the whole process of buying, selling, closing, you know, none of it is easy and it's all very costly. So it makes, you know, it makes the process both slow and um, not easy to transact. Tom, let's talk about, uh, I, I remember every time that I would watch Tasty Trade, I watch you and Tony, one of the things that was always interesting to me is I always wanted to be able to trade or manage my accounts and just do that. So if we've got students out there that go, that's what I'd rather be. I'd rather be a full-time investor, trader, uh, being able to do that. Talk, how does somebody that's in college, that's, that's you know young, in their 20s or their 30s, how do they start about this as a business? It's hard. It's hard for most people in their early 20s or mid 20s because um, you can trade and learn about financial markets. You can trade and learn about, you know, strategies and how to use today's technology and how everything works. But it is very difficult. Um, to make it into like a full-time business uh, only because of limited capital. You know, it, it really depends on, on you know, your, your capital resources. It's hard with a small amount of money. If you have a, a, a little bit more money, then the answer is it's possible. But if you have a limited amount of capital, it's challenging. But what's not challenging is using a limited amount of capital to create enough occurrences to teach yourself a significant amount, which will complement. Listen, four years of school is a lot. And a lot of these kids are gonna go on, a lot of people listening today are gonna go on to grad school. Um, you know, whether, even if it's not next year or the next year after that, they might work a couple of years, go back to grad school. And um, there, there's so much to take away from the experience that complements, you know, your experience in academia that I think that um, it's, you know, it, that part of it's invaluable. I'm not sure that it's the kind of thing, you know, can you, can you grind out some money? Absolutely. Is it the kind of thing that you want to build your career around at 22? I would say probably you want to get into it um, where you can learn about, you know, to me, the most important things in my life came from, you um, working in the industry and networking so that I met people and, you know, was able to, you know, listen, none of us come from any money. So we all just, you know, we all built our opportunities through networking and, you know, through learning. And I think all that's important. Now you can do a lot more of it on your own. I couldn't do that when I was, you know, when I was 22 or 23, because none of this stuff existed, but, um, uh, Still, I think the networking aspect of it's important. Taking the university education, combining it with trading skill, combining it with your ability to articulate it and combining it with, you know, in different opportunities inside of the world of financial services. Well, in the financial services world, Tom, you and your organizations have been disruptors. What do you see yeah. as far as the future of disruptive technology uh, just in the country and in the world in general coming up in the next few years? Well, the nice thing is that, you know, most people that we're talking today, I don't know the makeup of your of your class, but most people, you know, the, the U.S. has is in a very dominant position as far as financial um, markets, market structure goes and, and flow of capital. I don't see that changing, you know, anytime soon. I mean, when you look around the world right now, um, you know, Russia's imploding, Canada is, I'm sorry, uh, China is in a heap of doo-doo with respect to you know, their financial markets and what they've just experienced. And I think that when you look at Europe, um, they're too disjointed. So I look around the world and I don't see anything in the near term you know, disrupting the flow of capital to US capital markets and the flow of liquidity in this country. So I think that for, the, for starters, everybody's in a really good spot you know, if they want to stay in the world of finance, because most of the opportunity is going to be around here. Um, as far as disruption goes, you know, it would be impossible to overlook certain things that are staring us in the face, which is um, Web3 for sure, I think is, you know, potentially very disruptive. 
Um, it's interesting, especially um, globalization through tokenization. Um, I talk about it a lot because it, it kind of excites me. I see no borders anymore. And I, I think that, you know, we, we're, we would be foolish to discount um, decentralized finance in any way, shape or form. I, I think the future is very interesting in DeFi. And I look at various forms of blockchain and ledger technology. I look at um, various forms of yield farming and, um, you know, and even alternative portfolios whether that means whether that means you know NFTs or whether that means tokens or whether that means you know forming would, whatever we want to you know on a trading platform like I think two or three years from now on Tasty you, you know um, Bobby you're going to see the ability to potentially make you know combine political bets with S and P bets you know I'm going to bet that you know. Joe Blow is going to win the 2028 presidential election along with, you know, an S&P bet and pair them together. And I think that's coming. And I think there's no question that there'll be other things like, you know, derivatives on on digital assets, along with potentially sports and other things embedded in platform. So there's there's no reason these platforms aren't going to be completely universal and multi-currency and then a combination of DeFi along with, you know, traditional, um, let's call it fiat currency as well. So the dollar is the, the world's reserve currency. Uh, we've got crypto blockchain yeah. that, that, that's coming up. What does that do for the United States uh, leading the way in the coming years? Do you think that should the United States, uh, the government fully embrace it? Should they, should they become an obstacle to it? What, what, do, what do you see happening in that space, Tom? I mean, personally, I think the government should embrace um, a DeFi and should embrace digital assets. Um, I think that the asset class has become too big to be ignored. I don't think the US dollar is at any risk whatsoever, just like I don't think any other currency is at any risk because I don't see, um, I don't see digital assets as a, as a currency threat, as a transactional threat at all. But I do see digital assets as a very interesting asset class. And so I think that when you talk about, you know, listen, digital assets went from zero to $2 trillion in just a very short period of time. The, the next leap will be from 2 trillion to probably let's say four or 5 trillion. You can't, you can't um, um, exclude a four or $5 trillion asset class there's too much potentially in the way of tax dollars. There's too much in the way of trading dollars and fees and technology. Um, I, I, I can't imagine that they do anything other than embrace and build, you know, build a very um, uh, proactive tax and fee structure around it. And with, with regulatory guidelines and regulatory clarity that allows us to trade it much more actively I see, I see digital assets as a big part of our financial service future. And one of the things you mentioned, Tom, and, and I apologize, you mentioned something that just brings something else I want to bring up to, uh, but you mentioned fees. That's one of the big things that I speak with with our classes is, uh, you know, you've got to manage the fees in your trades, your investments and things. And, and we've virtually now gone to uh, zero commissions on stock trades. What, what do you see as the future of, of, of both regulation and of fees going forward in, in the financial industry? I think fees are about as low as they're going to get because they're, they're almost zero right now. You know, in some places like Robinhood, they're zero, but um, they're totally but, zero. But, but with but, Robinhood, you may have to wait two weeks to get your right. money out or to make another trade, Tom. Or you can't <laughs> trade certain things, like right. there's certain things. But even for firms like us, we've gotten to the point now where it's so low that, it, you know, parts of the business, like every time you trade a stock on our platform, we lose money. Like that's a stupid business model, in my opinion. But we do it just as an accommodation at this point. I think that fees are really low. I think fees will come down a little bit in crypto. Um, I think that's a given. Fees will be lower in crypto. I think that in the rest of the world, stock options, 
Um, futures may come down a little bit. Stock is already free. Options are next to free. So I don't see those two moving. Um, but I do think that fees will continue to contract in the financial, um, in the advisory business. And I think you're going to see the biggest contraction in fees in sports gambling. I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see exchange listed sports gambling that's going to take 90% of the fees away in sports gambling. There's no reason that, you know, a sports book should be a hundred times more than a financial exchange fee wise. So basically my butcher, it's Piggly Wiggly, who is my, my, my bookie. He's, he may be out of business, but the, the industry. Well, he, he may be okay because he's, <laughs> he's, he's not regulated. So your Piggly Wiggly guy, you know, okay. you want to do business with him. You want to trade on DraftKings. That may be different. Gotcha. Uh, talk. one thing that I contend is wealth building is simple. It's just not easy. Speak to our students about wealth building. Some of them are, we have uh, people who are in their 50s and 60s in the class. We have people in their 20s and 30s, uh, people that are fresh out of high school. Tom, talk to us about building wealth. You've, you've done it through, you know, several avenues. What must one do? There's great opportunities here in the United States for each one of us. How does one build wealth? You know, I can tell you my story and then, and then, but I don't really, um, and mine's a little different because, so, so I grew up with a, with a dad that was a, I think he was a socialist. I'm not really sure, but he was a civil rights attorney. My mom was an art teacher. So I don't come from a background where there was a lot of, you know, uh, I, I never even knew what a stock was. My dad was like opposed to stocks. Um, so I don't come from a background where this was, this was, built into me early on. Um, but when I got out of school, I went to um, uh, school in New York, upstate New York. And when I got out of school, it was, the economy was pretty bad. And the best interview I got was at a brokerage firm in New York on Wall Street. And they offered me a job on the spot. I just took it because I didn't have any other job offers. And I've stayed in this business now for, you know, over 40 years. So I, uh, it's weird how life works out that way because I didn't study finance. Um, but what's interesting is that I spent the first 20 years of my career on the trading floor and I just learned the damn business. Like I didn't think I was successful, so I didn't really care. And I had a good life and, you know, we made way too much money as young kids, but, but it, was, it was an interesting part of my life. And, and I learned a lot and I built some wealth, but at, at some point I realized there has got to be more to this building entrepreneurship and stuff like that. And so we went off and took all the money we had made. We said, hey, you know what? We may not be smart enough, but we may be, we don't know. And we're gonna go build Thinkorswim. And we went off and, you know, and we just rolled the dice and built, built Thinkorswim and it worked. And it was, it was, and we never once thought, oh man, we got this. Like Bobby, I swear to you, we never high five. We never even said, hey, nice job. We never even thought about it once. Um, and we didn't realize until we went public, you know, and, and we went public at some point and, and people, you know, loved the company. And then we finally realized, oh, we built something really cool, but then we were, we were a public company and we were kind of, we were bought out. We didn't really have much of a choice. We lost control of, of the board. Um, and then we started Tasty and it was almost the exact same thing. You know, we just were like, we're going to have some fun. My whole life has been about do whatever it is you want to do that that makes you have some fun and you enjoy your life and and don't worry about it like just every chance you get here here's the single most important thing that that well scott and i scott's the co-founder and we've done a couple of these businesses together we learned this a long time ago from trading on the floor whenever you have an opportunity to take risk in your life take it like anybody not like crappy ass risk where somebody goes you know, where, where it's like a long shot, it's a hundred to one or a million to one, forget that. Whenever you have an opportunity to take real risk and you can, and you can calculate how that's going to impact your life, don't overthink it. Whenever you can calculate the risk, um, then, then take it, take your shot. And most of the time you're going to be right. Like people underestimate, they, 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 they don't recognize 
how good they are at taking risk. Because most people don't take enough risk to be good enough at it. And it turned out we were good at taking risk. So when you were doing Think or Swim, I mean, you were doing something that was was kind of revolutionary. I mean, well, yeah. it was revolutionary. So, yeah. I mean, when you guys sat down and said, hey, I'm going to do this, what, where, talk to me about the fear, Tom. Was the fear of failure, was it there? Zero fear. We had zero fear of failure. We feared that we, the only fear we had was that we wouldn't be able to attract um, enough smart people to help us because we weren't technologists and we knew we needed a technology first platform. So our the only fear we had was that, can we attract smart enough technologists that would want to work for us? You know, we had the money because we had saved up money over a 20 year period, but we didn't know if we had what it took to convince somebody and a bunch of people, you know, to come work for us to build technology because that was outside of our scope. We knew what we wanted to build. We didn't know how to build it. Y'all, uh, Tom is one of the, the few <laughs> CEOs of, of, of a major company that still answers all of his emails. I mean, I'll send Tom an email. It may be one in the morning and I'll get a, a Tom, I don't know if you ever sleep. Uh, you know, he'll, <laughs> he'll, uh, he'll email me back by four o'clock in the morning. I mean, it's the strangest thing. But I mean, but it's great. And I think by doing that, Tom, by doing that personal touch, what does that mean for your business? What, what are your customers? What are your clients? What does that mean? Why do you do that, Tom? You don't have to do it. You could have people, you could hire anybody to do your email. You answer your own email. Why? Um, I think it's, I think it's been the most important aspect of our business over the last 20 years is that we've developed a very sticky relationship with our customers. Like I always say, name me another CEO in the world of financial service outside of Jamie Dimon, which good luck trying to get a response, but you couldn't name the CEO of another online brokerage firm. And we kind of feel that that's been, you know, it's been really special to us to build relationships with people all over. Like, you know, if I never answered an email to you, how would I ever be on here today? You know, so over the years, you know, we, we have literally thousands of relationships, 99% of them are great. And listen, all, all you can ask for from a firm is, Hey, just be res- build cool stuff and be responsive. Right. That's what, if, if I'm a customer of a firm of any firm, all I want them to be is, Hey, just be build great technology and and respond to me if I have a question. And and the rest will take care of itself. And that that model has worked for us. Tom, it doesn't seem like you slow down. I mean, you come out with Tasty Trade, that's not enough. You come out with Tasty Works, that's not enough. You come out with the small exchange, that's not enough. You come out with the Quiet Foundation. What's next? Oh man, I'm building. We're I shouldn't say I'm building. We're building some really cool stuff. I just started um, building a, um, a, de- a basically a whole DeFi uh, crypto stack, and um, uh, we're bu- unfortunately we're building part of it in Russia. <laughs> Hopefully, it's still around. <laughs> uh, you know, the cra- the crazy thing was I was supposed to go over to Europe this week, Bobby. I was leaving tomorrow and uh, to meet with a bunch of my Russian. We we got a team over in St. Petersburg, we've had them for 20 years. And, you know, and, and I, and they got, the meeting got canceled because the, the UK pulled all the Russian passports, um, all the visa requests, I'm sorry. So, um, so the meeting got canceled. So I called those guys today, just before getting on with you. <laughs> and I said, what, you know, what the F is going on over there? And they're like, I, they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, what do you mean? What do I mean? And, and they go, Oh, you mean that Ukrainian thing? And I'm like, they go, it's not even on the news over here. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my God. And, and it's it's so funny because I go, well, it's dominating the news over here. And they go, oh, that's so weird because it's not, you can't even find it over here. It's crazy. Wow. The world's wow. crazy. Yeah. Um, we do have a, a question. Uh, Matt says, you say you know 
what you wanted to build, but didn't know how to build it. What would you say the first step in figuring that out was? Well, the one thing, Matt, that's good is that we had a lot of experience 20 years before that. So, so we kind of knew what we wanted. Like we weren't, like if you, if I was getting into, let's just use this example. I decided I want to build something in the medical profession. I don't know anything about medicine. So I wouldn't have had the know-how to, to know what, how to build what I wanted, you know, what, what I would want to do or create or anything like that. I just didn't have the skill in the world of, you know, um, derivatives and um, futures, options, stocks, things like that. I just spent 20 years of my life, every minute of every day, you know, in that marketplace. So I kind of knew what I wanted to, at least I felt confident that I knew what I wanted to build. So I would say that it was a lot of experience that got us to that point. It's very hard for young entrepreneurs, you know, in their early, that's why when you look at, you know, people rip on like Zuckerberg or somebody like that, and they say, oh, this guy's a creep or whatever. But the reality is it's pretty damn hard at 22, you know, to know what you want to do and to truly disrupt stuff. I've been around a lot of really smart kids and it's a hard challenge to know what you want to do and what you want to build at 22, 23, you know, 25. I'll, I'll give you, do we have two seconds left? I'll give you this guy's a great time. A couple of years ago, about let's say now about eight years ago, these two 22 year old kids graduated. They just got their degrees from MIT and they showed up on, in my office. I had no idea who they were. They showed up in my office, they cold called me and they said, can we talk to you? They, they just Googled me and, and showed up in my office. And I said, I had nothing to do that afternoon. I was like, sure, I'll listen for half hour. I'll listen to you. And they gave me this whole pitch on they wanted to build a cannabis exchange. Now they were crazy smart, but they had no money. And they go, we want to build a cannabis exchange. I go, how much money do you need? They said, we need about $2 million. I go, how much have you raised so far? They go, none. <laughs> and, I go, and so I go, well, I mean, you guys seem like smart kids, but I, you know, I mean, I'm not going to, you got no chance of doing this. And they go, what will it take for you to invest in us? I go, if you raise 1.9 million, I'll give you the last 100,000. And so they said, they said, okay, that's a challenge. And those kids somehow went out and raised 1.9 million. And so I gave them the last 100,000, they had their 2 million, they went off and built their cannabis exchange. About three quarters of the way through building it, they realized this is never gonna work. I give them credit because they realized, okay, we bit off more than we can chew. We can't make, this won't work. But again, they were super smart and they learned a lot about building technology. They built some cool stuff, blah, blah, blah. They ended up selling the assets for, for everything that the investors had put in and they returned the $2 million to all the investors. Very classy move. Got my $100,000 back. I looked at these guys, I'm like, this is the first losing investment that I didn't lose on. <laughs> so I'm very proud of you guys. I go, what's the next step? They go, we're going to go out and build another company. Now they go out, same two kids, they go out and they build another company in the crypto space. And they raised $20 million this time because they're good talkers. They're good. You know, they're good. And they raised 20 million. They're still only 25 years old now. Second time, they, they blow the whole 20 million. They, they built this whole big exchange, crypto exchange, but the whole thing didn't work. They couldn't get any customers. They came to me, they're out of money. They literally had two weeks worth left of money. And they said, all right, we really need your help. I was not an investor. And I said, what do you got? And they told me the whole story. And I liked what they had. I just hated their model. So I said, here's the deal. Will, our company, will give you $3 million. And will, but you have to promise that you'll listen to me. You'll, you'll cut your expenses by 60% overnight, which means you got to get rid of half your team which they're their friends, but you got to get rid of half your team tomorrow. At least half your team is more than just that. You got to get rid of one whole business and, and you've got to go after a different markets, a different market center. And they go, and they said, well, it was either that or they, they close up shop. So they said, okay, we'll do this. And they just raised money on a 280, now this was, we did this valuation at $10 million. 
They just raised money at 280 million about, about a month ago. And they have everybody in the world trying to throw money at them right now. But now they're 29 and 30. So it took them eight years to learn. And these are two kids that are geniuses. And they just, and they just killed it. But that's how long the process took for two ridiculously smart kids who, who just had to learn how to be an entrepreneur. You know, and we basically, when they were completely busted out for the second time, we finally helped them. You know, it just said, this is what you got to do. But it's hard. It's freaking hard. Well, I mean, and we've talked about your successes, Tom, but I'm sure that you've had failures as well along the way. Are you kidding me? We failed so many times. I, 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 I can tell you stories about gold mines in Africa and oil wells in Texas and restaurants in Chicago. And, and um, I got mattress stores in LA. I mean, I didn't know what to do with my money over the years as I was, I mean, I, everything is a learning experience. I've learned, I've lost millions, you know, on all that stuff, but it doesn't matter because it all, you know, um, if somebody didn't take a shot with me when I was 22 or 23, you know, I don't know where I'd be. So I felt like I got to do all this stuff. Um, I've got a last question here uh, from Zach. You've built some amazing things. Please share some advice on balance, living up to your potential while avoiding burnout. Is Zach? Yeah, Zach. Hey, Zach, I got some bad news for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, this, is my, this is my worst topic. I'm a complete junkie. I don't have a life. I, I, do, not, I do not believe in work-life balance. Um, I, I have two normal kids. I work with both of them in different businesses. I have almost a semi-normal, not really normal marriage. And I, um, and I don't, I have no work-life balance. I have no hobbies. All I do is work. I mean, I travel a lot, but all I do is work and I'm fine with it. It's actually, it's actually how I, it's how I normalize myself. I just, I work my butt off and I, um, been basically doing that for 40 years and I don't, I don't have any other balance. I, I think it's bullshit when they say you need a work-life balance. Some people do. Some people like, you know, there's important things like their family is really important or their, you know, they may have other hobbies that are really important or there may be other social causes that are really important. I can really, I can totally appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I just, I've always focused on, on work and that's where my life revolves around. I, I don't have a good answer for you. I have a crappy work-life balance in the traditional sense. It works for me. And I don't see Tom Sosnoff being the, the type that's ever going to hang it up, retire, and, and you know, just go. No, sit no, on no, the no, 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 no. No, we die. We'll die on the job. You know, I mean, I hope I do. I hope I hope I'm still working, you know, and they roll me out of here someday. That's that's cool. But Tom, you've been doing this, you know, over 40 years. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Or, but are you able to enjoy your success? Do you realize what you've accomplished? And do you act, do you sit back and are you able to at least enjoy it? Um so enjoying your success is a really weird thing. Because if you think like some people think enjoying success is you is you can go play golf every day or you can go to some island and just lie there and order like you know, pina coladas and lie in the sun. Like if I spend two days ordering a pina colada, I want to kill myself. You know, like I, I want to be helicoptered off that island within, like it's not enjoyable to me. So, so I enjoy myself. Like my challenge now is building more stuff. Like, like we just started in, you know, more companies and we're building more stuff. And I, I have four tech I have four, you know, different technology stacks that we're building. I, I love the challenge of building stuff and, and creating. I don't, I don't care about, I mean, I'm honestly at the point, Bobby, I don't really give a crap about the money anymore. It's not relevant to me. I've already, you know, there's nothing, nothing I need. There's, I don't want anything. I just want to build stuff. So my legacy is, hey, he was a really good entrepreneur. I don't really care about, you know, anything else, but I do want to go to the Auburn, Alabama game. There it's been on my bucket list for my whole life. And 
I've never been able to go because it's always on the Saturday after Thanksgiving and we have family in. So it messes me up schedule wise, but that's on my bucket list. Oh, Tom, that'd be great. We need to make that happen for sure. Hey, uh, Tom, uh, listen, guys, Tom, you can get, you guys offer, you know, over eight hours of content, live content every day on the markets. One of the things that you've been a visionary for, Tom, is you, you're making it uh, not only for the, for the old folks to enjoy, but you're reaching out to the younger generation, which I think is really cool. I mean, yeah. you you know, uh, you've taken Errol and and Kay and and, yeah. and 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 taught them, and now they're teaching others. And that, I think that's what's really good about your organization is you're you're actually not just reaching out to Boomers and Gen Xers, and you know, you're huh. you're reaching out to, to to the next generation that's coming up. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I just realized. So we just hired an intern for our research team for the summer, but. He's he goes to Alabama. Roll Tide. Uh, yeah, that's what he said to me. And <laughs> um, I think it's our first. I think it's our first uh, Alabama intern. I got I got two from Texas uh, Texas Tech this year and one from Alabama. Um, but uh, um, yeah, we try to um, uh, listen. W- we feel it's super important to be around smart young kids with a lot of crazy amount of energy and, um, and they can teach us a lot of stuff that we don't understand. Um, and so, listen, you gotta mix it up, man. You gotta stay young. And that's how, what I hope the takeaway is from our students today. Uh, you look at Tom, you know, he's telling you, take some risk. And, and some of your work that you're submitting, I can tell some of you are reluctant to take risk. And it's like I tell them, Tom, in a hundred years, we're all gonna be dead, right? We're all gone. So do something, you know, enjoy yourself, find something that you love, do it, take some risk. And like you say, uh, not all of them work out, but some of them will. Over the course of your lifetime, if you start taking risk early, you're, you will be, you'll be so comfortable with it when it really matters. You know, like, like it doesn't matter when you're young. You know, I mean, obviously we're not talking about stupid risk, like, you know, driving 150 miles an hour, but we're talking about like, you know, calculated financial risk or business risk or, you know, personal risk, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Every chance you get, every opportunity you have to make that decision, you know, you never know. It's life-changing. Um, I, I told the story last week, I was doing a podcast with the Dylan Radigan and, you know, I told the story that, listen, you know, if, if we didn't, if we didn't network when I was 22 years old, I never would have ended up, I didn't even know where Chicago was. <laughs> you know, I never would have ended up there. Well, and, so. and, and just look what uh, what has happened by you finding Chicago. Even I, I mean, we won't even say that something good has come from you finding uh, Tony Batista, right, Tom? <laughs> well, Tony and I are both from New York originally, but yeah. Yeah, we met on a baseball field. We were playing softball together before we knew that, before we knew we were trading in the same pit. Yeah, please just have a way of working out. Tom, this has just been an honor uh, of you speaking to our class. We appreciate it so much. Everyone, uh, check out Tom and Tasty Works, the uh, brokerage. Uh, go to tastyworks.com. It's a it's a great lightning fast piece of technology. Uh, it's, it's really, really great. I trade on it every day. And also check out the educational content that they have at uh, tastytrade.com. And if anybody wants to send me an email, I'm just Tom at Tasty Trade. Happy and to he, answer any and questions. And he will, he will respond. He definitely will. Thank you, Tom, so very, very much. And uh, look forward to doing this again sometime. Have a great rest of your day, okay? And give us a big old roll tide, Tom. Roll tide. There you go. See everybody. All right, guys, thanks. Thanks, Bobby. <laughs>